Hey everyone, you guys know that I love myth and hero myths in particular, and you can probably tell that I love movies. And when I watch a movie, I do tend to look for the elements of the universal heroic narrative that we've talked about in other videos, probably because I find it really fascinating how the writer or director is going to incorporate some of those archetypal elements into the film. And I don't always know whether this is done intentionally or unintentionally. Um, I assume that most screenwriters are pretty well versed in the monomyth, but it's also possible that it's done unintentionally because, you know, a good story can only be told in so many ways. And I think every good story also has to conform to human life and experience. So recently I saw some advertisements for the movie The Tomorrow War. Uh, looking through the internet and came across some some advertisements. It didn't really strike me, probably because, number one, I might like sci-fi, but it's not my favorite genre of film. And to tell you the truth, what I did see really wasn't all that interesting. So I didn't think that much about it, but every once in a while, me and my wife decide we're going to sit down, we're going to watch a movie, and what we tend to do is we look for a trailer. We look for some kind of preview to see what's good out there. And by the way, Netflix, you guys, do the worst job showing previews for your movies, and you really need to fix that. We're always on our phones looking up YouTube to see what kind of trailers we could see before we click on anything. Anyways, we came across a trailer for Tomorrow War on Amazon Prime, and it actually looked pretty good. Uh, it was a time travel film, and me and my wife love time travel movies, probably because we love history, but also maybe because we grew up with Back to the Future, which happens to be another great hero's journey, if you haven't seen it. You know, it might be a little bit old now, but it's still one of the best time travel movies, in my opinion. Uh, you might not agree with that. Anyways, we decided we'd watch it, and I was surprisingly pleased. I thought it was actually a pretty good film. I know a lot of people bashed the film or didn't think it was all that great, but um, I was really impressed on how well it embodied the heroic journey, the hero's journey. It was a great example of the hero's journey story. So I decided I was going to make this little video about it. It's not really a review so much as a little bit of a discussion on how the movie really follows the monomyth pattern, deals with the hero's journey, things like we've done in the past with movies like Batman Begins and Ready Player One. So I'm going to go ahead and do this, but I do need to warn you that there are going to be spoilers. So if you have not seen the movie yet, you probably want to go do that before you finish the video. Anyways, let's go ahead and take a look at it. Here's the premise. You've got time travelers from 2051 coming back in time 30 years to recruit their parents and grandparents to save humanity. And you could already see a little bit of a political message being built in. The threat in this situation happens to be aliens. Surprise, right? <laughs> Anyways, the movie opens in the same way all of the best epics open in Medius Race. So you've got this scene with what we assume is our hero falling from the skies, this ultimate descent into fire and rain and falling into a pool of water. Right? This is the submersion. This is the descent into the underworld, the liminal experience. This is the um, belly of the whale motif. Literally a baptism by fire. And then the movie transports us back to what's essentially the present day, the year 2022, December, and we're going to get our introduction to our hero. Now, this guy's name is James Daniel Forrester. He is going to be kind of in his pre-transformation stage. Remember, hero stories are all about personal transformation, the development of virtue, the development of courage, the development of the individual personality as it manifests, right? So you got this guy, James Forrester, and we know a few things about him. They, they do a good job kind of setting up the character. He is a, he's a veteran. He is a biology teacher. He is a family man, and he is waiting on a call right? That call. He's somebody that wants a better life. He has a vision of a different future. You're also introduced to his daughter. You can already tell that she loves her father. She's got a lot of characteristics like him. I mean, the first time you see her in the movie, she actually salutes her father, kind of this military thing. So you've got that aspect of their relationship. And then you find out not long after that, and I'm not necessarily going to go in order, but not long after that, you find out that she's interested in science. Dad's a science teacher, right? So, um, you know, a lot of a, a lot of him is already in her. So she's going to be a major figure in the movie. The scene also introduces, in a way, Dan's dad, James Forrester, who has sent a Christmas card to Dan's daughter. And Dan doesn't want his daughter to have the Christmas card. He actually takes it and he throws it in the trash. And you get an idea of why this is because you see that his father has abandoned him. So you've got this kind of unique birth moment in Dan's life. We know a little bit about his background. We know a little bit about the fact that he's come from a broken family. We've got this dynamic that we're going to need to explore a little bit as the movie unfolds. But he doesn't want his father to have any role in his daughter's life. Right? He says there's no way that he's going to have a role. One of the big themes in this movie is how we actually grow up 
to become our parents. And that's a big theme in mythology, right? You've got this idea of the struggle of the generations from some of the earliest myths that we have, right? The struggle between the Titans and the gods. You've got stories of children being abandoned by their parents, left in the wilderness to die, and then being raised, kind of alienated from their, from their parents. Loss of identity, all that kind of stuff is profoundly present in mythology. And it's one of the reasons a lot of the early psychoanalytic theorists like Freud and Rank and Jung um, dealt with that whole family dynamic in their theorizing about myth. And I think that's one of the major themes of the movie. We're going to see how much Dan is like his father, James. I mean, in fact, Dan's actual first name is James. He's named after his father. So that's going to tell you something. And as the movie unfolds, we're going to see more and more how much like his father he is. And it's not surprising that we're like our parents. Um, I remember this one moment. It was a holiday a couple years, I think, after my father passed away. And we had a pretty good relationship, me and my dad. So um, it's not going to be anything like Dan and his father in the movie. But it was, uh, I think it was a family Thanksgiving dinner. We got a big family, Italian family. And we're sitting around the kitchen table, which happened to be right near the garage door. And the kids were playing. You had all these kids running around making all kinds of noise, which can get really irritating. But um, they're coming in and out the door, opening the door, slamming the door, opening the door, slamming the door. And I remember turning around at one moment and just saying, hey, in or out. And it's not how I said it just now, but when I said it at the moment that I said it, I realized it's not only what my father would have said at that same moment, what literally came out of my mouth was the tone, the voice of my father. And immediately I just started laughing because it was so weird how I became like my dad. But I think that's something that we all do. And of course, James and Dan in the movie have a bad relationship, which I'm going to elaborate on in a little bit. But even in spite of the fact that Dan doesn't want anything to do with his father, it's going to be interesting to see how much like his father he ends up becoming anyways. Now, in this whole scene, you find out that Dan doesn't get the job, right? The phone call that he's on, is, the job's given to somebody else. And he's completely distraught. He's discouraged by the whole episode. And you get to see a little bit of his courage because as he's talking to his daughter, as they're watching the soccer game and everybody's around them, he, he indicates that, you know, to be the best, which is what he wants to be, he needs to be willing to do what nobody else is willing to do. He actually says, I will do what nobody else is willing to do. He says that to his daughter, and that's going to be an important line in the movie. And right after that, he says you know, in, to himself, and in a prophetic fashion, I am meant to do something special with my life. So at this point, I would say we could say the three major themes of the movie are reconciliation, parent to child, this idea of finding meaning and purpose in life, and then you're also going to have this idea of second chances, and all three of them are actually intimately connected and pretty common hero stories. The response that's also interesting is how his daughter talks to him, right? How she interacts with him because she says, it's going to be all right. And his immediate response is, you know, I should be the one saying that to you. So we could already see that this daughter, who's just like her dad, is already kind of stepping up into his role, right? She's, she's doing what he should be doing. Okay, And that relationship is just as important, really, as his relationship with his dad. So it's his three generations that we're talking about here. Grandfather, father, and daughter. So it's at that moment in the movie that we get the call to adventure. They're all sitting around watching a soccer game on the holiday. In the middle of the game, everything is interrupted by this portal that opens up in the middle of the soccer stadium. And out come these soldiers from 30 years in the future and they're losing a war. They've got about 11 months to human extinction and they issue a call to their fathers, mothers, and grandparents to save the future. And you could already see, like I said, a political message being built in the background. As a matter of fact, in the very next scene, pretty much, I think it was the very next scene, you've got Dan teaching his biology class in school. And it's, of course, right behind him on the wall is a video playing showing the climate change issue, right? The polar bears and where we're going in the next hundred years. So clearly, this is part of the message of the movie. And he emphasizes, of course, the importance of science, right? You've got this idea that it's up to us, this generation now, to save that generation that's coming up. What are we going to do here and now for our children, for our grandchildren? That's kind of this theme that's built in the movie. And, and I kind of like the way they handle it. It's really not very subtle. I mean, it's obvious to anybody watching the film what they're trying to do, but it's also not in your face at the same time. So they kind of take this middle ground, um, and I don't think it detracts from the movie. Sometimes when a movie is overly preachy, it can detract, but I don't think it does so in this movie. So this general call to adventure that's been issued 
prompts the entire world to react. You've got 12 months from the time that the call goes out to the time that we're going to pick up next in the movie, and the entire world is mobilized, right? You've got the first worldwide civilian draft ever. You find out that less than 20% of the people that jump into the future are going to survive, which is really, really bad odds. But Dan's call to adventure actually comes after that classroom scene. He's taken by the military. We find out in this scene that he's going to die by the year 2030. You know, seven years in the future, he's going to lose his life, which, of course, is the reason that they're calling him. This is the whole idea of the, the time paradox that you see in so many sci-fi films, the idea that you can't exist in two places at the same time, which is why they're taking people that are going to be dead at that point that they're jumping to in the future. So Dan, anyways, is going to be drafted. He's being conscripted. He's being called back to active duty. He's given this jump band, and he's given 24 hours to say goodbye to his family. And that's where we get to the, the refusal of the call. He goes to see his wife, and we find out that his wife is a PTSD counselor, and she's sitting there with these guys that have already been to the future and back. They've survived, but they've lost limbs and they're traumatized. And as soon as she finds out that her husband is about to go, she immediately reacts the way you would expect her to react. She says, you know, don't do it. We need to run. We need to hide. We need to get out of here. And that's the refusal. She wants him to go see his dad, who happens to be this conspiracy theorist who's in hiding from the government. He's got an engineering background, and he might be the perfect person to help Dan get the jump band off of his arm. And in the next scene, he does that. He goes to see his dad, and his dad is played by J.K. Simmons, who is one of my favorite actors. And it's not a good situation. I mean, here's a father and son who obviously have a problem with each other. There's conflict literally right from the first moment they see each other. But his father's going to help. His father, of course, wants to help. And he even says in the scene, you've never asked for help. And, of course, Dan's immediate reaction is, you know, that's all we've wanted. You know, we've always wanted your help, and you were not there. His father basically abandoned him because of his own PTSD. He was a Vietnam veteran. It's kind of that wild versus civilized thing that we see in myth after myth after myth. You know, where do you find that balance? How do you turn off the, the side of you that had to engage in all these horrible atrocious, violent actions and fit back in the normal world with your family, right? This is the, the challenge that Heracles never seemed to be able to master. So he says, you know, I was in a dark place when I got back. I couldn't recognize myself. And it wouldn't have been good for me to be in your life, you and your mother. It was better for both of you that I wasn't there. That's why his father abandoned him. And, his, and Dan doesn't buy this. He says, I don't buy that. You're a coward and you quit. And what's worse, he says, you don't get a second chance. But it's a hero movie. So you obviously know that that's exactly what this movie is going to have, is that second chance. So we have to see how this works out. That, that whole scene, by the way, ends up poorly. He doesn't end up taking the jump band off, and he responds to the call. Goes home, says goodbye to his daughter. You have a very touching scene where he vows to return, but immediately after that, he's put into the orientation. And you find all these other people that are in the same situation with him. They're called heroes for the first time. They're called to sacrifice themselves for the good of the future. And the cool thing is you meet a couple other characters. Um, what I'm going to call the triumvirate in the movie, and you've probably watched some of my other videos on myth, and it's very common for hero stories to have trinities of characters, three major characters that work together, whether you're talking about Star Trek, Star Wars, Harry Potter, you see it all over the place. This movie does it as well, which is one of the things I thought was pretty cool. Um, it's not a real tight-knit group, not like, you know, Harry, Ron, and Hermione, but you do have these guys, Charlie, who happens to be a... Um, geothermal scientist and kind of the, the comic relief in the movie. He's a really awesome character and I love the guy that plays him. I don't remember his actual name uh, as an actor, but he does a great job. So he is going to be there. And then you've got this other guy, Dorian, who is definitely not comic relief. He's the serious, uh, committed warrior. He's a veteran. He's done a number of jumps to the future and has a death wish. Literally, he has a death wish. So the three of them are going to be kind of this platonic trinity, this idea of the platonic soul, right? The noetic, thumotic, and epithumotic that we've talked about in the past, where Charlie's definitely the noetic one. He's the reason. Um, Dan, he is going to be the spirit. He's the thumotic one. And then Dorian, the third figure, he is going to be the epithumotic, the appetite, the, the passion, the aggression, the uh, anger, the physicality that you have. All three of them put together are going to be this really neat little team, and we're going to see how they work together at a number of points down the road. But I like that the fact that they, they work that in there. And of course, Dan's got to be the central character, right? He's the protagonist in the story. So when we talk about him being the spirit, being the heart of the team, he's the one that is the, the one who sees hope and has a purpose and kind of unites the other two. One who wants to flee, one who wants to definitely um, lose his life in the fight. Dan's kind of this middle point, this balance, kind of this Aristotelian virtuous character, right? So anyways, 
After the orientation, we've got supernatural aid, the crossing of the threshold, the belly of the whale, the road of trials. All this stuff kind of comes together at one particular moment when the call is to jump to the future. So when I talk about supernatural aid, I'm not talking about magic or anything supernatural in the sense that we tend to think of in fantasy films. I'm talking about technology that's beyond what we've got right now, this idea of time travel. I would put that in the category. The idea of the jump link, which is going to teleport these guys into the future, that's clearly supernatural. But it's also a crossing of the threshold moment where the heroes are all going to go off. And we're already really into Act 2 because remember your transition from Act 1 to Act 2 when you've got the call and you've got the initial threat that's presented. So we're kind of in that scene, but when we do the transition into the future, we've kind of crossed that threshold. We're now definitely in the area of initiation, right? The separation takes place and find themselves immediately in the belly of the whale. The movie opened at this scene. The jump takes place. And it is a, an incredible descent. I mean, they're supposed to land like five to 10 feet off the ground, but something goes wrong in the jump and they're way up in the sky, falling to their death. Most of them actually do die in the midst of fire, in the midst of rain. And it's just by the narrowest of margins that Dan lands in a rooftop swimming pool, which basically saves his life. But again, the submersion in the water, the waters of death, We've seen it you know, in Gilgamesh. It's a baptism scene. He's in hell. This is a baptism literally by fire. So when he comes up out of the water, his baptism has taken place. We are on the road of transformation. That's what baptism is all about. It's about dying and being reborn different. Now, the road to trials is going to take place over the rest of the movie. It's going to be one episode after another. It's an action film. I'm not going to go into the details of all the action scenes, but it was actually pretty well done. And we're going to be introduced finally to the big bads in the movie, the White Spikes. I wanted to say White Walkers, but totally different franchise, which I also adore. The White Spikes, and you're going to find out really quickly how deadly they are. But Dan is part of what's known as Research Force, or our, our force. And his team is given this mission to go into this research center, basically first to save the research scientists, but also to recover a toxin that these guys are working on. And this is the boon, right? This is the ultimate goal. This is the quest. Right? This is the elixir of life. This is the philosopher's stone, the holy grail, the golden fleece, whatever you want to call it. This is the thing that they need to find. When I say elixir of life, I already called it a toxin, so you know it's actually a poison. But it's poison for the aliens, and it's life for the humans. Now, when we first see the white spikes, it actually is in the research center as they're, surprise, surprise, descending once again. You're going to be surprised at how many times in the movie you're dealing with this descent motif. They're descending down this stairwell, getting out of the building with what they can take, the toxin, and the white spikes are right above them and they're going to pounce. And you're going to have this horrible, really devastating battle scene that's going to ultimately end up with the jets flying in, strafing the whole area with bombs, this fiery hell, this death scene. And Dan and his few survivors wake up, who knows how much later, in the hospital at the base camp. Right? This is kind of his death and resurrection moment, which every hero really has to have. And it's at the base camp that we get a little bit more information on Charlie and Dorian. We're going to find out about Dorian, why he's doing what he's doing. He's a man who doesn't believe there's any hope whatsoever. As a matter of fact, the reason he's going to die in the future is that he gets cancer. And he knows about that and he wants to die the way a hero should die. He wants to go out on his own terms. This is Enkidu, right, from Gilgamesh, who you know doesn't want to die sick weak in bed. He wants to go out like Beowulf, fighting the dragon. He wants to go out the way the Norse warriors would go out. If you're going to get to Ragnarok, you got to go out swinging. And that's the way Dorian wants to go. So when I say he has a death wish, he literally has a death wish. But of course, Dan, very different. Dan actually believes there is hope. Okay, So he keeps that front and center. There's, there's a purpose. And of course, it's his love for his family. He wants to get back to his daughter, who we're now going to talk about. So this is the meeting with the goddess, right? This is traditionally the mother, the sister, the bride. I think it works just as well with the daughter. We've seen her on screen, but Dan's only interacted with her through the radio. Romeo Command doesn't know that this is his daughter, but now he's going to meet her in person. So you have this moment of revelation, and it's really cool that she turns out to be like her dad. She's a colonel in the military. She's a soldier, but she's also a scientist. She's got her PhD, and she doesn't give her dad a hug. So immediately you're going to find out that they have this broken relationship. We don't know why, and we're going to find out over the next few scenes, and I'm going to kind of unpack it a little bit now for you. But you get the idea that, you know, she wanted to be like him. She said, I wanted to be like you. I wanted to be you. 
And we find out what actually happened is when Dan comes back from the future, he ends up ultimately leaving his family. And he says, I would never leave you. And she says, that's what we thought too. Which tends to tell us a little bit about how little we know about ourselves. Right? Here's Dan who doesn't want anything to do with his father. At the same time, he's already transforming into his father. He's going to do the very same thing his father does. And he doesn't understand how he can get to that point because he loves his daughter. He can't imagine abandoning somebody he loves as much as he loves Mary. Now, she's got a mission for him, right? He's there for a reason, not a reunion, at least as far as the plot's concerned. As far as the theme of the movie is concerned, he's definitely there for a reunion. He's definitely there for a reconciliation. Now, this is going to be the impossible task, and it has to do with, again, getting the toxin so that he can bring it back to the past, mass produce it, stop the whole thing from going in the direction that it's going in. Again, that would be the whole idea of second chances, one of the themes I said we need to talk about. Now, his daughter's in his life, but she's also going to present herself as a temptation. And when we think of temptation, I know it's immediately sex that we jump to, right? We think of temptation as a sexual temptation. Well, it doesn't have to be that way. It's a temptation that is going to distract the hero from his mission. His mission is to save the future by going back into the past. So what I mean by temptation here is that his love for his daughter is going to actually cause him to risk his life several times in the movie and actually disobey commands that could jeopardize the entire mission at least twice. The first time is on a mission to apprehend the, uh, the queen. The, uh, the mother, the, uh, the, the white spike female who is bigger and badder than all the others put together. And he's the, she's the most important one to get a hold of. And the mission is to go secure her, bring her back, and start working on the toxin to see what they're going to be able to use that's going to affect her because nothing has yet. And in this particular scene, which happens to be another descent scene, they fly in with the helicopter. Dan is specifically told, stay on the helicopter. And then the other soldiers go down and try to capture this thing. And Mary, Mary herself goes down and things go bad. And what does Dan do? he leaves the helicopter, exactly what you expect him to do. He's not going to see his daughter in danger down below in the pit of hell. This is like going down for Beowulf into the swamp to deal with Grendel's mother. And he goes down to deal with the white spike mother, saves his daughter, but again, disobeying his mission, disobeying the commands. That's the temptation that I'm talking about. He could have lost everything if it went poorly. Of course, it doesn't because it's a hero movie and you know it's going to have a good ending. Anyways, they get a hold of the white spike mother. They bring her back. And now we can talk about the ultimate boon, which is the, the toxin. The, the next couple scenes deal with the production of the toxin. You find a little bit more about their relationship, but they're in the process of making a toxin that's going to work. He's helping his daughter as a scientist, not just as a soldier anymore, but as a scientist. They eventually get a toxin that's 100% bond. So that's what they need. That's what they need to protect. That's what they need to mass produce. But of course, you can't do it. There's not enough time to mass produce the thing right here in the, in the present. Things are already so far beyond hope that this is a lost cause, which is why she wants them to take the toxin into the past and mass produce it there. Because if they could get to these things before they spread out over the earth, that's going to be the salvation of humanity. Now, Dan, remember, knew he had a purpose. And his daughter throws his own words back at him. She says, I'm asking you to do what nobody else is willing to do. The very same words that he used to her 30 years in the past, she remembers them and she calls him to it. So what about the refusal of return? I mean, the mission is to return to the past. Yet, very common for the hero in some way to refuse the return. And Dan definitely refuses to return. So now that they have the toxin and the entire complex is being invaded by an army of white spikes trying to rescue the female, you know we're at this climactic moment where everything is in jeopardy. The, the, the toxin that they have, Dan, all he has to do, stay alive until he can be teleported back into the past. He's got a time set on his jump band. It's already counting down. There's moments away from when the jump is supposed to take place. Remember, they're only there for seven days. But as the countdown is going on on his jump band, everything is in jeopardy. The entire complex is being overrun. Everybody is dying. The jump link itself is in jeopardy. If they destroy that, he's not going to jump at all. Mission over. All he needs to do, him and his daughter, is basically survive. Buy themselves time so that he could jump back. And that's where the temptation comes in once again. Because his daughter and him, as they're fighting their way up higher and higher to get to the jump link to do what they can to save it, she gets grabbed by one of the white spikes and is pulled off the edge of the scaffolding. And she's falling to her death. And what does he do? Probably exactly what a good father should do is he goes to try to save his daughter. He goes to rescue her. But in doing so, he's throwing his own life after hers. 
It's a hopeless situation. She is going to die and he is going to die with her in choosing to do what he does. Forgetting about the entire mission. Maybe the better thing for him would have been just to hide. Wait, countdown's going off. But of course, in the movie, it happens to be in the last second. As he's falling to what would be his death, he's teleported out. The last jump before the jump link is destroyed. So there's that temptation. Now, is he a failure as a hero? He could have been. Luckily, he's been saved. So you've got this magical flight, the rescue from without, the crossing of the return threshold, all take place in that one instance. And boom, he's back in the past. And he's got the toxin. It's the return. You would think the movie is about over at that point, but of course we know that you still haven't really dealt with the problem. As a matter of fact, there are several problems that you haven't dealt with. We still need to deal with the actual plot of the story, which deals with the monsters, but then we also have to deal with the theme of the story. Is he going to go down the road that his father went down? Now that he's back, is his future still to abandon his family and abandon his daughter? That all needs to be resolved. And we also have, what's the deal with his dad? He hasn't resolved that. So we know there's a lot more work that needs to be done. And of course, even though he's got the ultimate boon, he still has yet to become master of two worlds. So we're going to have this mass production of the toxin, and we just have to bide our time. We know that the white spikes are going to attack for the first time in 2048 in Russia. So as long as we can get prepared before then, things are good. But a little bit of detective work takes place, and Dan realizes that it's not that they're going to arrive close to 2048, but they're already there now. And if they can get to them in Russia, where their spaceship has crashed, and attack them preemptively, they can stop the whole thing. Of course, nobody's willing to do this except for our triumvirate. Dan, Dorian, and Charlie are going to go on this final quest. And then they need somebody with a plane and somebody who's not afraid to cause an international incident, and you know who that's got to be. It's his dad. Dan goes in and says, I need your help. And this is exactly what his father needed to hear. Now, it's because he loves his son, and Dan understands this probably for the first time. And it's because Dan understands at this point how much he loves his daughter and the fact that he is going to do the exact same thing his dad did if. And so it puts everything into a new perspective. So here we are at the end of the movie, the climactic scene. This is the, 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 the last descent that we're going to have. They've got the boon. They're going to go into Niflheim, right? The Norse idea of the underworld, the snowy wasteland, descend into the cave. The entire team's going to go in and they're going to attempt to kill these things before they thaw out, before they are able to attack anybody at all, which is a great plan. You know, it's this moment when you can give the world a second chance. Dan actually says second chances are hard to come by. But he's not only giving the world a second chance, he's giving his dad a second chance. And he's giving himself a second chance. So there's the theme of the movie. And this is the moment when everything goes wrong. You've got the most uh, amazing battle scene that takes place. It's really an intense moment. Dorian finally goes out the way he wants to go out. He gets the hero's death. And it's a happy ending, right? This is what he wanted. This is good for him. You got this battle between the female White Spike and Dan and his dad, this showdown at the very end of the movie that is, you know, on the edge of your seat. It's, it comes down to the wire, but of course you're going to have a happy ending. Dan and his dad basically sacrifice themselves for each other. They don't die, but they're willing to die for each other in that moment. The world is saved. Kind of got a happy ending and a resolution at that point. And of course, Dan is now master of two worlds. Present in the future, wild versus the civilized. His life as a warrior versus his life as a family man. What could have been as to what is now going to be. And it's also the freedom to live. So you've got this last homecoming scene where you've got not only a reunion between Dan and his daughter, but a really important reunion of grandfather and granddaughter as Miriam meets for the first time her, her grandfather. And you know that they're now going to have a relationship. There's an atonement. The family dynamic has been fixed. The future has been changed. And most importantly, Dan has been changed. We know that he's not going to go down the road that his father went down. And he says, it's she, she, the daughter. She changed me. There's your hero's transformation. With courage, he's now made for himself a future, the best future. As a matter of fact, he says, the best future was right in front of me. So it was, a, it was a good film. It might not be the best hero's journey movie ever made. It might not be the best science fiction movie ever made. Like I said, this isn't a movie review. I don't really have a rating system that, I, that I've thought of coming up with. I guess I could rank it on the scale of epic poets or something like that. I don't know, is he down here by well, like Apollonius of Rhodes or is he up here like with Homer or with Virgil? And there, you could have a debate right there. You know, Homer or Virgil, I don't know which way that would go. You know, I'm gonna put Virgil up top a little bit higher. Um, it's not a Homer. Um, might not be an Apollonius. Maybe somewhere in between. I don't know. I thought it was a good movie. But anyways, I think that's good. If you haven't seen it, and I just spoiled it for you, I'm sorry. But I did warn you in the beginning there were going to be spoilers. So go see the movie if you haven't seen it. 
And if you have seen it and at least enjoyed it, watch it again, and this time think through the hero's journey as you do it. Anyways, that's it. Take care. Thanks for watching. And don't forget to subscribe to my channel.